Okay, today I'm in Hampshire with Peter Webb, who's a professional trader and also the founder of the Bet Angel software company. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us today, Peter. That's okay. Um, straight away, you developed this software. Why on earth did you share what must have been a massive edge? Well, if you take yourself back to when I first started um, in the markets, the, the markets were uh, pretty vacuous. There was nothing going on. It was a, a very new concept. Nobody really understood it. So I was um, running around financial um, in, investor and trader exhibitions talking about the concept of trading on sports. But the problem that we had back then was that there was nothing in the market. There was nothing like it is nowadays. So uh, if you look at racing nowadays, it is about 10 billion um, in turnover. But back then there was almost nothing there. So I saw the opportunity back then, um, but there was no liquidity, no, um, there was nothing to trade. <laughs> So eventually um, I figured out that uh, I had to talk about it, had to get the message out, to tell people what was going on. Uh, but the most important thing for me was to develop some software as well. Um, so I had to go out um, and actually create the software uh, to be able to actively trade. And the problem I had back then was I needed to raise some funding to be able to uh, produce the software. So actually the decision was made, maybe incorrectly, to uh, actually commercialize the software um, and bring it to the market. Um, and that was pretty much how Bet Angel sort of was founded and formed. So I do believe that before you became involved with the internet, you were also the scourge of not only the pools companies, but the bookies. Can you give us a bit of a background there? Yeah, when you, uh, if you go back to the very, very start of my career, the, um, where I started was I had a little home computer. I used to get the Rothmans annual yearbooks and I used to plug away and type in all of the football results from the news of the world at the weekend and, and historically from Rothmans. And that allowed me to actually go off and create uh, a model that allowed me to predict draws and other things to do with football matches. So that's where I started. But when the National Lottery came around, I sort of gave up on attempting to do anything on the pools, although I, I did win a first dividend on Littlewoods. Um, and then I started going to the bookmakers to try and deploy a variation of what I did uh, with the bookmakers uh, around football betting and uh, doing complicated bets. But after initially taking my bets, I won some large amounts and, and that was my career with the bookmakers well and truly over. And I, I pretty much walked away from the gambling industry then until um, we ended up with betting exchanges and it was betting exchanges that brought me back into the mix. Was it a eureka moment when you found the exchanges and you suddenly saw that the whole world had opened up again as far as betting went? Yeah, I, I pretty much sort of ignored it. I didn't think that there was ever going to be uh, a future for anything to do with gambling and uh, bookmaking and uh, sports books and stuff like that. So at that particular point, um, when betting exchanges came around, I suddenly felt that there was going to be an opportunity. Now, the problem that I had... I joined Betfair eight, uh, eight, seven or eight days after they opened for business. I think it was eight days. But um, there was really nothing there. So I got involved very early on, doing a bit of arbing, um, going into the football markets and offering odds at what I thought was value and waiting for people to, to take the positions. But it was very um, thin, not much going on. But it felt to me like this was something completely new, that we could actually go to a completely different level. Although if you would have asked... Uh, now uh, or back then what I'd be doing now I wouldn't have dreamed it would have ended up roughly where it has so it's obviously grown significantly since I first dabbled in the markets all those years ago. So when you first discovered the exchanges did you go back to your original sort of calculations about how to predict draws on the football etc and if so did it not work on the, on the exchanges? Yeah well the, the funny thing was they um, I really originally started arbing. That seemed to be the most obvious opportunity when I went on to the exchanges. So I'd go and find a price from a bookmaker somewhere, uh, go onto the exchange, and then I'd just lay it on the exchange and wait for somebody to take it, and then just net uh, the difference between the two. Uh, so that was the very first thing that I did. That sort of got me to level one in terms of my career on the exchanges. But uh, what I also did was then I started offering up prices on draws. And, um, and just generally offering up prices on football matches at areas where I thought there would, would be a bit of margin. And that sort of got me up a, another level. Uh, but one of the days I woke up in the morning, um, I was going to bookmakers, backing Tiger Woods at 14 to one, laying it off at 10 
on the exchanges. And I just thought, why don't I do both on the exchange? And, and that's pretty much how trading was born. I just figured out that rather than trying to arb between different parties, why not offer just both positions onto the exchange? And uh, yeah, that was, that was the breakthrough moment for me. So your, your personal business now, uh, betting or trading, is bigger than the bet angel business. Have you diversified into a lot of sports? Yeah, the, it's always the, the most important thing for, with everything that I've done is that the betting and trading and doing all of those things in the market is the most important thing for me. So that's, that's been the number one priority and that's what's driven the development of Bet Angel and, and that of, of the users of Bet Angel as well. And um, if you look really at where most of my activity is, when I first started trading, I was doing stuff on football, golf, sports that I knew particularly well. I was even doing financials on, on the exchanges, though they're not so popular nowadays. Uh, but when I discovered horse racing, suddenly there was this whole world of opportunity opened up to me. Um, but the problem is I didn't know much about racing. But yeah, the, the range of sports that I do is quite diverse now, but it mainly focuses on football, uh, racing, and I'll also do tennis, greyhounds, and golf. But golf for me is really focused around the majors, simply because that's where most of the key volume is. But the trading is the number one important thing for me. That's where I spend most of my time. And obviously the software is you know, part of that mix now. Um, but it, the software became a, a business accidentally almost because it wasn't created to be a business in its own right. It was just a way of us being able to develop software that allowed us to do all of the things that we wanted to. So do you need to develop models to try and anticipate market moves on each of those separate sports and how much work goes into that and how often do you need to update? The, it's, a, it's a shame actually, I don't have it on my desk, but my kids bought me a uh, cup that um, says uh, I love spreadsheets. <laughs> And that's often the, the, the mug that I have on my desk somewhere. And uh, I, I, I spend enormous amounts of time plowing through data. So every single market that I trade, um, every market that's available, will gather data on. Um, and actually you have to spend a lot of time looking at that to understand what's happening because initially it was just to understand how the market was priced, then it was to understand the way that uh, the market moved. Um, but increasingly over time markets tend to shift and change so it's important to spot when those changes are as well but yeah I think there's always another layer whichever sport you look at uh, when you look at golf you can look at the way the course plays but you can also look at individual players and the way that they play and they'll have different aspects to its game so I think if you want to really get underneath the sport you need to spend enormous amounts of time analyzing it looking at it getting to really truly understand exactly uh, what's going on and how that's likely to influence the market. And how much work would you put into a spreadsheet before you decided that I'm barking up the wrong tree here, this is a dead end, and decided that you know, you're, going up, you're going the wrong way? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question actually, because I think probably nine out of 10 things that I look at are a complete waste of time. And uh, own a, there's, a, there's a lot of difference between having a great idea and then actually putting it into practice. So. First of all, you've got the inspiration for an idea. You, you could be watching TV, watching a sport, or just walking in the countryside or something, and then suddenly an idea will pop into your head, and off you go and run with that idea. But I reckon about nine out of 10 times, you just sort of look at it and you think, well, okay, the market's efficient, the market knows what it's doing, and I have learned nothing here. But in fact, you actually learn something every time you, you do something along, the lines, uh, along those lines. But the most important thing is actually putting something into the market because very often whatever you thought about in theory doesn't translate in the market. So I, I, I'd say, you know, advice to anybody that's out there, whatever idea that you've got, it's more important that you actually do something with it because it may turn out slightly different or you may learn that there's a discrepancy between what you thought and what happens in the market. But yeah, I, I, I do spend a lot of time just plowing through stuff to see if I can find anything uh, new or interesting, but probably every month I discover something new that I hadn't thought of before. And where does that seed come from? Well, the idea. Yeah. Um, it could could come from anything. New. I'd, I'd say the best genesis for any idea is, is a whopping great loss. <laughs> because that will almost certainly um, make you rethink exactly what you're doing. And people often pursue very high probability strategies because everybody loves to win. And constantly winning all of the time is a good feeling and makes you feel great. 
and it's easier to cope with losses when losses occur. But in fact, some of the best strategies are doing unusual things that don't appear to have a payoff that do actually produce a payoff. Um, so most of the, I'd, I'd say the best genesis for an idea is, is failure. But sometimes you do get just genius ideas um, from out of the blue. But because I love sport and I love watching sport, very often you'll spot something and you'll sort of think, I wonder what influence that has on the market. And very often that's where I get my ideas from. So when you come up with a genius idea, how long generally have you got it on your own before somebody else cottons onto it and ruins it for you? <laughs> the, the market's always very competitive. It, it's, it's actually quite difficult to find something that other people haven't found. So if you go, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword really, because I talk quite openly about stuff that I do, uh, but I feel that part of my role, having been in the market at the very, very beginning, was to promote the idea of, of, of stuff that I do for, for two reasons. One is to grow the market and the other one was to convince my friends, neighbours, relatives that I was actually doing a real job. <laughs> uh, so I feel you have to talk openly about these things and explain to people what you're doing and, and why you're doing them. But when you look at um, any particular idea, I think that you pretty much have to run with it over quite a long period of time before you can have any idea as to whether it's working. Um, so if you look at racing, you know, you've got the jump season, you've got the flat season, the flat turf season, and you've got the all weather. So a strategy that works on jumps may not work on the flat. And if you run it throughout the year, that's the only way that you'll find out that that, that makes sense. So you have to almost segment it into different areas. And I think the hardest thing to do is to find a generic strategy that works generically well. It's better to segment it into individual markets. But if you look at my career, uh, when I first started, I feared that maybe whatever I was doing would be gone within three years. So I worked ridiculously hard over those three years, day and night, um, without sort of coming out of my room. But the longer I've gone on, the more I realise that it's not only finding something that works that um, is important, but it's also the ability to be able to do it. And part of that is tied into the psychology bit as well. So the psychology of you having the balls to take a big position when you know the, that that is correct, but also you have to think about other people in the market and the way that they act. So I'd actually say it's a mixture of different things. Find the strategy, execute the strategy. You can copy a strategy um, a lot, but sometimes not the execution, but also um, the psychology of betting in terms of your ability and other people in the market, I think is something I've learned extensively over the years.